Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one sarah dixon sarah dixon is a certified dog behavior consultant who originates from british columbia canadia but she's currently working for instant instinct dog behavior and training llc in new york city Sarah has articles published in the APDT, Association of Professional Dog Trainers, Chronicle of the Dog, on clickertraining.com, as well as in a collected anthology by Ken Ramirez titled Better Together, The Collected Wisdom of Modern Dog Trainers. Sarah teaches workshops on dog training and behavior throughout the United States and Canada and has spoken at the APDT conference multiple times with her dogs, Siberian Huskies, past, Belgian Shepherd and Australian Shepherd. Sarah has trained, competed or titled in many dog sports, including obedience, rally obedience, ski drawing, dog sledding, agility, musical freestyle, herding, tricks and nose work. Sarah specializes in behavior problems such as fear, aggression, anxiety, and reactivity. Most of all, Sarah loves helping people build strong relationships with their pets. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Sarah Dixon to the show today, today, who is patiently waiting by. Sarah, how are you? I'm well. How are you? Doing fantastic. You and I are smashing out a double recording right now aren't we so we've got right at the start of about three or four hours worth of talking absolutely as you said i am in new york city (laughs) which means you get to enjoy the wonderful background noise that comes along with new york city and we may have some sirens or loud music in the background from people driving by so just a word of the a word of warning there that can that can definitely happen. So this is a animal training podcast and a window into the world of what drivers listen to in New York City. Not even just not even drivers just sitting in your apartment <laughs> and what and, the poor poor dogs here have to deal with. And something we didn't mention in your bio there, Sarah, you've just recently acquired a new title. Yes. Um, So I am very new this year as the president of the IAABC, which I think you've talked about before, but for those who don't know, it stands for the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. Yeah, we're really excited about this because Sarah and I have been talking for the last month or so and been connecting with other people in the IAABC team and we're going to be... Hanging out with each other. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's a, the start of a new, productive, wonderful relationship, I think. Yeah, lots of, I won't say too much now, but having lots of great conversations and excited about things moving forward. Hey, Sarah, let's dive in. Can you take everyone listening back to your early days, where you first got started, where you learned about positive reinforcement animal training and some of the animals you trained along the way? Yeah, so I have a pretty good story about this because for me, it actually came down to, um, you know, just one certain dog that I had. I have always been interested in working with animals 
Um, although we only ever had one dog growing up who was a little on the slow side. <laughs> very, very sweet, but not the quickest to train. Um, I had a lot of smaller animals growing up, birds, lots of parrots, lots of, you know, guinea pigs, hamsters, rats, that kind of thing that we did training with. Um, but when I moved out of my parents' house and kind of went off on my own, I started fostering dogs from the shelter and working with them. And it was very interesting, but unfortunately the person who taught me at first was not a positive reinforcement trainer. So I started out using very non-positive reinforcement based methods that when I think back on it now, I have no idea how, but they actually worked. Uh, <laughs> it, I did seem to manage to have a knack at solving behavior problems, even though I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, and then I ended up getting my own first dog. And she was a beautiful Siberian Husky named Maui, who I got, uh, she was just about three years old. I bought her from some people who had been severely neglecting her and she basically lived her life on about a four or five foot chain. Um, and she was really emaciated. She was the best dog. Uh, she just passed away a couple years ago, actually. Um, but she didn't respond too well to those methods that I had been taught. Surprisingly, um, she didn't really want to work with someone who wasn't very nice to her. And her behavior was okay. She was a pretty good dog, so it wasn't like, you know, incredibly tragic or anything like that. But I started to get interested in maybe teaching her some agility or something like that. And the community that I was involved in, which was, you know, correction based training, didn't really have answers on how to do that without, you know, without using treats. So I went, well, I'm going to put her in an obedience class and see how she does. And it happened to be a clicker training class. And from the very first class that I did, I was hooked. So the first class wasn't even with the dogs. It was just like clicker mechanics and playing some clicker games. And I loved it. I thought this is amazing. It was definitely a light bulb moment for me. And then the next week I got to bring my dog and it was like a completely different dog. She was engaged. She was loving it. She showed me how freaking smart she was. So that is how I discovered positive reinforcement training. And with that I actually ended up mentoring under the trainer who taught that class. So she taught me some more. Um, I, you know, did, we did some really cool stuff taking like some of her trained mini horses and chickens and dogs to kids science camps. Um, she helped me start in behavior work. And that's sort of how I got started as a professional dog trainer. But the really cool thing is like this dog <laughs> that I got, who Huskies are sort of notorious for not being super trainable. She went on to get obedience titles. She got rally obedience titles, trick titles. She was a certified therapy dog. And that that was all because of, you know, how amazing clicker training and positive reinforcement training can be. So for me, that was really cool. I don't know if I would have had that light bulb moment without that particular dog, or at least not as fast. But because of how different she was with that training versus the training that I'd been taught, it was really, really clear to me that it was a very, very powerful way to work with animals. Um, and I've, you know, since then trained, I've had parrots of my own that I've trained with positive reinforcement. Um, I trained one of my cats a little bit. He hasn't done a ton, but he's done some targeting and shaping. And, you know, I did that for part of Karen Pryor Academy when I went through. Um, and then, you know, mostly now I work with, with some of the toughest problem dogs and one of the toughest places to, to work with, with animals. So it's been quite the journey. <laughs> yeah. And that time when you were working with now, was it working with Naui? Was that his name? Oh, Maui, like um, Maui. like the Hawaiian yeah. island, which is a really weird name for a husky. But she came with it, and I just I just couldn't change it. It somehow suited her. I I, I wrote down Naui. I spelled the name like the, <laughs> the the word now followed by three e's. <laughs> Okay, Maui. And and this was back in British Columbia, was it? Yeah, I actually was living in Alberta, Canada at the time that I got her. I was doing um, university there. Um, so I got her in Alberta and then we moved back to British Columbia after a couple of years. But yes, right. back in Canada. Cool. And then fill, fill us in between that time working with Maui and uh, working a lot with Maui because you guys seemingly achieved a lot together. Yeah. Uh, then then what happened in between 2018? 
Uh, <laughs> and oh, and also, uh, sorry, sorry to hear about Maui passing recently. It sounds oh, like she, she was a great she friend, had, a great. She teacher. had a great long life. She was a wonderful teacher, a wonderful teacher, like one of those dogs or one of those animals that comes into your life that you're just like, wow, you know, I've learned so much from you. Um, it was really quite a gift that she gave me. Um, so I started. Because of her, I started training dogs actually full-time professionally in 2008. Um, so I got my first job as a dog trainer once I sort of felt that, like, you know, I could teach multiple dogs multiple things and could could train my dog to a certain standard. That was important for me to, to get titles on her because I wanted an object objective standard that I sort of knew what I was doing. Um so I started just teaching pet obedience classes and I mentored under the, the trainer. Her name was Donna from Alberta that I mentioned. Um, wonderful, wonderful animal trainer. And then we moved back to BC and started our, I started my own business. So I just sort of worked there for a while and there wasn't a ton of trainers in the area, but made friends with the ones that were there, which is always good to network. And as I was there for, hmm, how long were we there for? From 2009 until 2016, um, I just got, you know, more and more experience doing different things. I started teaching workshops, um, on clicker training and tricks and all kinds of stuff. And then I ended up getting a job offer to come and work in New York. So we crazily decided to do that, which involved, you know, uprooting our entire family uh, and driving for six days across Canada and U.S. and moving from a town of like eight, nine thousand people in the mountains to Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> it's been a really big change. And uh, in between there as well, I've done different courses. I did Karen Pryor Academy in 2013. I've done the um, Behavior Works Living and Learning with Animals course more recently. I've done the IAABC Principles and Practices course. And I, I found the IAABC um, one year when I went to the, the APDT conference and met Michael Shikashio there, who you've had on uh, your podcast. And Michael was like, hey, you, I know you from Facebook. Uh, you need to come and join our organization. And I was like, OK. So he convinced me to try to certify. And I did. And I passed. And I've been certified as a dog behavior consultant through them since then, which is four or five years ago. And I've been on the board almost as long. So I've been very involved with the organization for several years, and it's been great. Um, I jumped at the opportunity to be on the board. At the time, I was also nominated for the APDT board and another organization's board. But when um, Mike asked me if I'd come on the IAABC, I was like, yes, it's a very good fit for me and how I train and how I think. Awesome. So I've just been making a couple of notes where you've been writing yes. and I'm really keen to unpack a little bit more of, of certain parts of your story. Yeah, um, absolutely. You said it was 2008 that you started to train dogs professionally because yes. you, you wanted to wait until you had like an objective standard, <laughs> you said. Can, yes. can, you, can you explain to everyone, we're going to talk about certification later in this podcast yes. because that's that's something the IAABC is really big on and something that I'm, I'm really excited about and uh, super keen to take this opportunity to, to spread information about. About. Back in 2018, though, 10 years ago, uh, why, why was it important for you at that point to kind of get this objective standard before you started your professional career? So for me, it was important because I knew what I could teach my dog. I felt like I knew what I could teach other dogs. But I do think that there's a lot of value in, you know, doing trialing because you're taking your dog out of their comfortable environment that they always work in. You are not allowed to use food or toy rewards in the trial ring. And that is a challenge for a lot of people to train up to. Um, and to show that your training can hold up without reinforcement for the time you're in the ring, um, and that your dog understands the behaviors clearly and solidly and can, again, can perform them without food or toy reward under pressure because <laughs> the dog's under pressure and so are you. Mostly it's the handler. The dog's like, whatever, this is the same game we always play. Um, but you're under pressure and somebody's watching you and they are grading you to a standard that is you know, not my idea or your idea of what's good, but more like the dog has to perform certain tasks. The dog can do it or they can't. Um, so I did basic obedience. Um, oh, my brain just stopped for a second. Uh, obedience trials with her and she got her first level title in that. And she actually did very, very well. She, she passed in one weekend. 
So we did uh, basically one trial and she got her first title. And then she ended up actually having back issues. So I switched her out of competition obedience and started doing rally obedience, which she was phenomenal at. Um, I hope that answers your question. But I guess like for me, because I was a newer dog trainer, it was important for me to have somebody else sort of who didn't know my dog watch my dog work and say, you know, yes, your dog can do stay, your dog can come, your dog can heal, um, you know, to this certain level of standard that is, you know, for a companion dog without food, um, you know, under uh, testing. Awesome. And this, this was with maui right yes yeah right and and we we had at the same time in the mix donna from alberta yes <laughs> the fabulous trainer and i just want to talk about something we mentioned a lot at animal training academy and uh, as a big buzzword within the, the community within our tribe and that is ripples we like this idea of kind of those mm. small things that happen that kind of just create that ripple in the pond and they just spread out. So, for example, one of the ones that I pulled out in your story, which I thought was quite cool, is you're on social media, you're interacting with people, and Michael Shikashio uh, sees you and he says, hey, you, I know your social media. And look how that changes the course of your life, right? Right. Like, I mean, we, me and you are sitting here talking right now and the people listening to this podcast are listening to that podcast, listening to this podcast right now, possibly because of that one interaction. All the interactions you had on social media so let's go back to donna and let's go back to maui and let's because i'm a big storyteller a bit of a geek about that yeah <laughs> Let, you you did warn me about storytelling <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's think you know let's think about what what ripple kind of sticks out in your mind what what story from maui or donna or both of them kind of like did something that that sets you on the course to, yeah. to where you are today so I think for Maui, um, I've got one for each of them, actually. For Maui, the ripple with her was she showed me the power of positive reinforcement training. And it was clear as day. Like, I took her to that class, and I had a completely different dog. And she was never bad to train, you know? Like, I never thought that our training wasn't really going anywhere. She was well-behaved. She was under control. I could take her off leash. Um... She was friendly, she was social, but I got to a point where I wanted to try more with her and the training that I knew was sort of leading to a dead end because it was very dominance based. And that's not really, it's a good way to suppress a dog, but it's not really a good way to, you know, build behaviors. So this was like a light bulb is like, wow, holy cow, this is an amazing way to learn. Um, and my dog was so wonderful and engaged, uh, and that really set a spark for me to uh, pretty well abandon what I was doing from the past and, you know, go full on into learning about um, clicker training and positive reinforcement based training. So that was a big ripple for me, that dog, because I easily could have just kind of kept going on the same path and, you know, probably become a professional dog trainer. Uh, not a great one, um, because that stuff to some degree is effective, but not for when you really want to kind of get into building behavior that's strong, that's fluent, that the animal enjoys. So that was a big difference for me was seeing the change in her attitude. She was enjoying training. She was invested. Instead of avoiding me, she was actively engaged. And that was just amazing for me. Um, with Donna, what was really cool with, with Donna, uh, her name's Donna McLaughlin, by the way, is she knew who I was. It was not a big town. It was a small community. She knew who I was. She knew the style of training that I was doing. She knew who I was taught by. Never did she judge me. She accepted me into her class w with no judgment. She never made so much as a snide comment about, you know, how I trained or who I taught with. Um, and when I wanted to learn more, she brought me in under her wing, so to speak, and was like, yeah, come on, I'll teach you. Um, so that it was a really cool example for me as like a first sort of interaction with someone from the positive training world. If she had had a different attitude, I think it would have been completely different. Also for her, setting up the class where it was 
Humans Only the First Class was a big light bulb moment for me. So getting to actually experience how the dog felt was really cool. And that was, um, you know, something that I hadn't really thought of because I was just under the impression that there was only this other style of dog training. I didn't really know that much about training dogs. I'd mostly worked with my birds growing up. Like I said, we only had the one dog and he was a little daft. Um, So this literally opened like a whole new door for me. And she was just so kind and encouraging and supportive. And whenever I wanted to learn, she was there. And, um, you know, anything I wanted to do, she was like, yeah, let's do it. So those are kind of some big, I think, ripple moments for me, one from each of them that really stood out. Awesome. So shout out to Donna McLaughlin from Alberta. Did I say that right? McLaughlin? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from Alberta. Uh, good on you. That's amazing. It's so nice to hear those stories of... Um, and, and how important was that, you know, that she kind of knew a little bit of history about you and your your potential? And that's something that I, that's something that I try to maintain myself when dealing with other trainers and other professionals is to be very non-judgmental and kind and open and to reinforce the behavior that I like. Um, so something that I do that not a lot of other people do is I very openly will, you know, teach workshops on clicker training and positive reinforcement training to, you know, what in the U.S. and Canada we call more balanced trainers. I don't know if you have a different term there, but, you know, people who are going to be more open to perhaps using more force or pressure, um, I will have no problem going to teach a workshop if they request it. And my logic behind that is if they are wanting to say, hey, I know what you do, you're very open about it. I want to learn what you do. I don't, I want to foster that learning. So I have always had that attitude, which I kind of, I think, learned from Donna to just, you know, be open. And if people want to learn, let them learn, give them the tools and not to be judgmental and negative about people to reinforce the behavior that we like instead of, you know, being punishing, socially punishing towards people, which is the same way that we try to work with animals, right? Yeah, it's so important. And I, and I love when you were talking about Maui there. Yeah, she said in your story about ripples, setting a spark. <laughs> and I, I, I laughed to myself because when we did a podcast with Linda Ryan uh, a few months ago, she she talked about setting sparks. <laughs> so yeah. it's, a, it's the same thing. So And you said they're building, building behavior in the animal that is strong and fluid and the animal enjoys. And so that was kind of that spark that started then. And those ripples still flowing into this podcast today. So pretty excited about that. Hey, we've already talked about it uh, numerous times, but maybe just remind everyone um, what, you, what you're doing now, not right mm-hmm. now, but <laughs> in 2018, <laughs> and, and where people can go to um, get in touch and find out more about you. So currently right now I'm working in New York City for a company called Instinct Dog Training. And Instinct is a pretty cool company. They're one of the largest dog training companies in New York and they do board and train that is all positive reinforcement based. So that's not something that's really common, um, especially on the scale that they do. And what's really cool about Instinct is they're actually working on franchising right now. So they're hoping to sort of bring that to, you know, more locations across the U.S. and Canada and and maybe more in the future, uh, because it's a really, really neat thing to be able to offer board and train, which is a fantastic way to, you know, make a big dent in desensitization, counter conditioning and be training alternate behaviors. Uh, it's really helpful for a lot of dogs, especially in the city, and it's really helpful for a lot of people, but not a lot of positive reinforcement trainers do board and train. So it's a pretty neat company. Uh, what I do for them is I am currently the full-time uh, behavior consultant. So I go all around the city, which is really cool. And I get to meet all sorts of different people and different dogs and work with them on developing training plans and modifying their dog's behavior. And I am current president of the IAABC. So we talked about them a little bit more. Let me know if you want to go into that a bit more. Um, The IAABC is an organization that is international, so we operate all around the world, uh, (laughs) trying to get our little fingers into more countries. But we do, we're we're multi-species, so we have dog division, cat division, um, parrot division, and horse division, and hopefully, you know, more in the future. But you can join us as a supporting member and join our, get access to our community. So we have some great Facebook and mailing lists um, and a lot of really uh, affordable or free education for all of our members. We also do certification. 
So IAABC offers certification for behavior consultants in dog, cat, parrot, or horse specialties. And our certification, in my opinion, is I think the most rigorous in the industry for behavior consulting, at least for what I'm familiar with in North America. I don't know what you got going over there. Uh, but it's pretty cool. It's a very, it's not a... Not an easy certification to get, but it's well recognized as quality by a lot of vets and vet behaviorists. Uh, So it's worth looking into, I think, if you work a lot with behavior consulting with one of the aforementioned species. But joining as a supporting member is definitely an option for anybody who's interested um, interested in animal behavior or currently working with animals but doesn't feel ready to certify. Um... Yeah, our, I, one of the things that you're going to be hopefully working on is maybe some of our education. <laughs> so we do a lot of like really cool webinars and courses that you can take. I mentioned the Principles and Practice course, which is a multi-week online course with a bunch of amazing teachers like Susan Friedman, Ken Ramirez, um, a whole bunch of other people that have been on your podcast. But that's something that is... Um, a great course to take if you're looking for more education in animal behavior and you want to do something that's online so you don't have to leave your living room. <laughs> right, so if I'm sitting at home, or well, probably probably not, who sits at home and just listens to podcasts now? I don't know. Let's say I'm driving my car and there's listening gotta, to podcasts. There's got to be somebody. <laughs> if you're yeah. that person or if you're someone else that might be driving their car and listening to the podcast or taking your dog for a walk or whatever, if you're listening to this and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're at that Sarah Dixon stage of 2007 where you're, where you're looking for that potentially something more to kind of take you to that level where you, where you can maybe explain your credibility to other people. Is, is, is that what it's about? Like what, what for the listeners of this podcast, what is, what is from your perspective going to push them over the edge to make them go, ah, you know, today I'm not going for my IWABC certification, but tomorrow I want to work towards setting that up. So that's a good question. And I think that I'm going to pull it back to what we talked about before, which maybe this is why you mentioned it. I think you had a plan um, of, for me, it's, it's always been important to have my work judged by an objective standard. So not what I think is good, not what my friend thinks is good, but something that is, you know, taking my work putting it down on paper or putting it in the ring and having someone who doesn't know me and doesn't know who I am sort of look at what's there and, you know, saying, yes, this is good enough to pass or no, it's not. Um, And then, you know, okay, well, I have to go back and and learn more. I have to go back and practice more. Oh, hey, my dog broke their sit stay, so I guess I better practice that more. Or, oh, hey, you know, my case study was not strong enough, so I'm going to have to work at this a little bit more before I come back. Um, I do feel that especially in the dog training industry, since we don't have uh, industry-wide standards and regulation, there are several really strong options for trainers to certify themselves. And I do think that this is really important, again, because we don't have set standards, to have a objective standard that someone who is going to work professionally with companion animals can, you know, can you take an exam or, you know, um, go through a process to say, yes, your knowledge is certified at an acceptable level for dog training or behavior consulting in, you know, with your chosen species. So there's IAABC and ours is I think a little bit harder than some others, Um, but there's also other options with the CCPDT, who's the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers, and they offer um, a certification for dog trainers and behavior consultants as well. So there's definitely options for people who are professional animal trainers who would like to have some letters behind their name. Um, For me, it's important to do for myself, but I think it's also important for our industry, for us you know, as animal trainers to say, hey, um, you know, I'm willing to step up and say, yes, I am, you know, I do have knowledge to a certain standard um, because that's something that I think could be expanded on in the future as perhaps some standard regulation regulation for dog trainers, which I think is really important and kind of lacking in our industry right now. So a couple of reasons there. So, so self-development. So if you want to maybe push yourself. Now, I imagine for some people who are living in their town and their locale and that's kind of a – do you find people think that's a scary thought? Like is that – Oh, yeah. 
a lot of people are very daunted by it. But um, what, I, what I always tell people is that certifications will likely increase your referrals. Um, I know for me, when I got my IAABC certification, I saw a huge increase in veterinarian referrals. So <laughs> there's reasons to do it that are also career advancing, because who doesn't like being busier and who doesn't like getting referrals from vets? So self-development. Uh, career development. F- career development. So <laughs> as, have you found that, I mean, uh, maybe you can't speak to this, uh, and you said earlier you don't know what we have over here in New Zealand. Um, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm going to I'm going to claim ignorance on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I mean, we don't we don't have any certification bodies like the IAABC, uh, and, and I think people in New Zealand might uh, look towards an organisation like the IAABC um, to get their certification. As you can, as you said, you can yeah. kind of do that. Um, you can it, you can certify with our organisation from anywhere in the world. And do you, do you know? So the the vet industry in North America is aware of the IAABC? For the most part, like I cannot say that every veterinarian knows what they are, um, but I definitely found that once I had my certification, I got more referrals from vets, whether they knew about the organization or they went, oh, what's this? And looked into it and, you know, went, oh, wow, you know, this is something that nobody else in the area has. I'm going to send my training referrals to this person because she's, you know, got this certification, which I think is is really fantastic. Um, but a lot of veterinarians do know who the IAABC is, at least in the US and Canada, as well as vet behaviorists. We've established why you might want to do your certification, but you might, you know, not be up to that stage. You might just be listening to this podcast. And, and one of the things you said earlier is you can just go and jump in the IAABC as a supporting member uh, and you get access to the community and the, the content. What, is, what does all that look like? So we have, um, my favorite is the Facebook groups uh, because I'm on Facebook more than email lists, but we also have some really awesome email lists and you get access to, you know, anyone who's certified or sporting member that wants to be on those lists. And we have some really cool high level conversations that go on there. If you're stumped with a case, it's somewhere where you can go for help and, you know, not going to have people come at you with poor attitudes. Attitudes. Um, so it's kind of neat also to see what people who are, you know, leading in the industry put up there as like, hey, this is where I'm a little stuck or here, let me share with you, you know, this really interesting case that I've been working on or hey, look at this study that I found that's relevant to our interests. Uh, so the, I like the groups a lot. We also have um, we put out a quarterly journal and the journal is uh, free for the public. But it's a really cool perk um, where we put together, you know, articles, case studies. Um, that's a fantastic resource to have. And we also have, for all of our members, access to, like, tons of free or inexpensive education. So, like I said, there's webinars, there's courses. You can go and log into your members' account and see all of that. Uh, and that is like a gigantic library. To my knowledge, I don't think that any other organization has as much of a library for their members as we do. We also have, you know, um, a library for people who are working in animal shelters and, you know, doc- well, animal trainers can use this too, but it's, you know, how like how to handouts that they can, you know, give to people who are adopting to help with behavior. Um, we do mentorships. So in addition to our courses, we also have, you know, mentorships with people like Michael Shikashio and Trish Lohr, uh, or sorry, Trish McMillan on, you know, all kinds of different subjects. So there's tons to choose from. And as a member, a lot of it is free. We also do conferences, which are not free. But as a member, you get uh, access to anything that we've had recorded from the conferences in the past, which is fantastic. So you can look at the past couple years conferences and see as much content as we have on there. And that's all free. Well, as a supporting member, I just learned about a bunch of things that I still have to go and investigate. Yeah. So I would I would jump in there and uh, digest some more of that stuff. Yeah, well, um, you're pretty fresh, so you'll have to go searching through your member library and see what you can find. I, uh, I just have the IAABC tab open on my computer yeah. um, all the time. That's like I have your Animal Training Academy tab open now, <laughs> just all the time. <laughs> Looking there you go. There. So, so the next thing you guys have to do, listen to this podcast and girls, is to uh, bookmark the IAABC and ATA on your browsers and just have them open 24-7. <laughs> and so for the people that 
are wanting to be more than su- supporting members. So, so that the membership works in structures, right? You got supporting yes. members, and then you have certified members, and then and then. So, what's the process for for starting your certification? How do you, how does one go about that? Well, it is a bit of a journey. Um, you have two months to do the application, but you have to submit uh, multiple case studies. You have to get a reference from a veterinarian, a client, and a colleague. They don't have to be very in depth. Uh, we'll just contact them and ask them a couple of questions. And the case studies have to be, you know, fairly high level, concise, and complex. So we're looking for case studies um, for behavior problems. So dog aggression, dog dog aggression, dog human aggression, that kind of thing. Um, and then we also have a series of paragraph essay questions to answer. Um, not necessarily essay questions, but like you know, not multiple choice questions. So you have to like you know, write in the answers, so some definitions and things like that. And then we also provide uh, several case studies and ask questions pertaining to those case studies to test sort of the applicant's behavior consulting knowledge and problem solving skills. And it will take you the two months to do. So the whole process from putting in your application to finishing the, finishing the certification is around a two month mark. Yeah, I find most people tend to take the two months um, because writing the case studies out is actually a lot of work. So if you wanna shave some of that time, you could write them before. There's a there's a sample um, on our website, but uh, yeah, most people take the full two months. <laughs> I haven't heard from a lot of people that are like, oh yeah, I finished it in two weeks. Uh, most people are kind of finishing it closer to their deadline, whether because they've put the time in or they slacked off, I couldn't say. I'm pretty sure I sent mine in on the last possible day. So there you have it. Awesome. And we'll link to all of this stuff uh, in the podcast write up. So you're listening to the show and going to your browsers, and well, you've already got your IAABC and ATA tabs <laughs> open. So, <laughs> so you can just go there. And, and another really exciting thing you're doing recently, and I, and I want to uh, say I've got a bit of a knowledge gap here. We've talked about it before, but it, it is pretty new. So you know, I'm kind of absorbing it and, and um, building my understanding around it. But yes. was one thing you said earlier was you know, there's a few places to go and get a certification. It's not just the IAABC. And yeah, what's... every everybody has their pros and cons, I think. Um, sorry. I'm go not, ahead. That's, that's okay. I was just going to say, you know, what, what you, I think you mentioned earlier what was important is that this kind of becomes standardized over time. Yes. Um, so, so that's something the IAABC is working towards, isn't it? Can you talk about some of the recent developments and and potentially some things sure. to look forward to. So um, one thing that's come out recently that I think is really fantastic and I can't take much credit for it because I have to tell you that it was our amazing executive director, Margie Alonso, who put in by far the bulk of the work to make this happen. Um, our, our board consulted somewhat, but this was this has really been Margie's baby and what a baby it is. Um, so we were able to consult and work with the CCPDT, who I mentioned previously, as well as the APDT, who I also mentioned previously, and uh, what has come about from, you know, our, our conversations with them, which is really just amazing, is the three organizations have agreed to take on a shared code of ethics and standards of practice, as well as adopting the same standards for um, LEMA training, which is what IAABC has sort of uh, adapted from Stephen Lindsay and promoted as our sort of ethical guideline of maximizing, you know, positive reinforcement and avoiding using force, pressure, punishment in our work with our animals. Um, So all three of those organizations are adapting the same code of Lima, the same code of ethics, uh, and the same standards of practice, which is really exciting. So those are three kind of major players in the dog training and animal training industry in North America. And (laughs) typically what's happened is everybody wants to sort of have things their own way, but we've been able to sort of put aside some differences and meet in the middle and come up with something that is a step forward in hopefully bettering our industry towards some set standards. It's very exciting. It is very exciting and, and congratulations for your contribution to that and, and obviously a massive shout out to Margie Alonso for, uh, as you said, her baby and what a baby it is. <laughs> what a baby it is, <laughs> yes. 
Um, I mean, because yeah, I can I can imagine those conversations. You know, they they require um, good relationships, trust, and yep. time and attention, and, and putting aside differences, as you said. But you, you've been successful, and you've managed to come up with these shared code of ethics and standards of yes. practice. You talked about Lima training. Yes. Uh, can you can you unpack this a little bit more for everyone? What what does that look like? What are these shared code of ethics and standards? Yeah. Of practice? So uh, I mean, if you want to learn more about them, you can definitely. I'm not gonna go into super detail on them because it's not that exciting. But basically, like what the code of ethics is, is it is uh, kind of insurance that if somebody is like certified through IAABC for example, they're going to be held to a certain standard of, uh, you know, keeping their education current, providing um, quality educate or quality information to their clients, um, acting with integrity to other professionals as well as clients. So that means things like not offering guarantees to your clients because it's just not how it works. Um, and, you know, not, not bullying, cyberbullying, other professionals, um, you know, not slandering other professionals, uh, as well as maintaining up-to-date education. So it sort of tells someone who is looking for a, an animal trainer that if they're, they are certified through us, um, and now it's going to be through these multiple organizations, there is a sort of a, a kind of industry level standard of like, you know, this trainer is going to have education. This trainer is going to treat me with respect and provide me with good quality, up to date information. They're going to treat my animal with kindness. Um, and they're, you know, maintaining an education and that that can be held accountable. So that's really important because now we can sort of work together and be able to back up if there's complaints from, you know, clients or other professionals. If somebody is not abiding to those code of ethics, there can be uh, consequences, um, which would range. But basically, we can be informed of it and take action to ensure that people who are certified through these bodies and APDT doesn't certify. So they're going to, how they're going to play into this is a little bit different, but it lets us to, you know, take action and make sure that the people who are certified with us are providing quality and are acting ethically. And so what, what's kind of some of the conversations or, or some of the agreed upon, um, guidelines for lack of a better word is probably the completely wrong word here guidelines <laughs> or or practices with regards to, to holding accountability is is that kind of an ongoing thing once you've got your certification that you are providing information about your activities so um most organizations that offer certifications are going to ask that this to continue to remain certified the certified member continues ongoing education so that's something um um, that most of the organizations that, that are going to offer the, the variety of certifications are going to, to request, which I think is really important because you, then you can't just say, well, you know, I was IAAB certified 15 years ago and I haven't done any continuation since or continuing education since then. Training world changes a lot and it changes rapidly. So staying, making sure that your trainer is staying up to date on modern methods is important. Um, as well, making sure that, you know, you're not mistreating your clients, human or animal, um, and you're not mistreating, you know, other professionals. I'm not sure if that's answering your question. <laughs> I feel like I just repeated myself. Um, so if you want me to clarify on anything, please ask. Yeah, I just, I just guess what's, what's the process around that, is it? Oh, well, so that's that makes a little bit more sense. Um, the process is that, like, if somebody has a complaint, so a client or, or another professional, they can submit it as an ethics complaint. And then it is evaluated by a series of committees. Um, it's very in depth and we try to make sure that it is, um, you know, anonymous in the fact that the person who is obviously the complaint is lodged against doesn't know who it comes from. And it goes through several levels. Um, and what we always try to do is come up with a solution that is going to help the person who has had the complaint lodged against them learn. So it's not just, hey, you know, you were mean to Brian, we're kicking you out. We'll actually try to set up like a, 
you know, like a, a, a mentorship so that they learn why what they did was inappropriate and can move forward um, and change their behavior so they choose should they choose to. So it's not, honestly, it's not terribly common that it happens. And a lot of the time, if we do get a, an ethics complaint, it's resolved fairly easily. Um, but it has actually gone through the full course where like if things can't be resolved simply, it goes to an independent hearing panel, and it's quite the rigmarole, but um, I mean, we have a serious system set up for it, and we, we do take complaints, um, you know, we do take them seriously, and we have we do try to make sure that it's gone through in a fair and appropriate manner. One of the things that we want to make sure is that the complaint is accurate, so that people can't just, you know, say, oh, so-and-so said this, and, you know, the person is getting for lack of a better term, corrected unfairly, we want to make sure that that, that the, the, um, the the complaint is actually is actually true. And so if someone has a complaint, where, where do they go to kind of lodge a complaint? And then is it is it the organization that the person was certified through who has to do the consulting? Yeah. Is it so kind of a joint body? Or? For now, like if you wanted to send in a complaint against an IAABC member, you would email, you know, just our general email. If it was a CCPDT, mem- you know, certified member, you would contact them. That may change for the future. But for now, that's how it's how it's working. And we just sort of have agreed to the set, you know, code of ethics which is just sort of like, you know, like I said, these three organizations coming together and saying, yeah, we accept these as like a general standard. Uh, So hopefully it's something that can help the industry move forward on that. But as far as like if someone wanted to make an ethics complaint for now, it would go to the, the industry that the person is certified under that it relates to. Awesome, and I'm, I mean, we've got a, it's so great, it's huge leaps forward, and I'm sure everyone listening to this podcast is, uh, like me, excited and um, keen to keen to see where this is going, because it, it can only get better, and we're going to obviously all learn as we go, aren't we, and be exciting to see where we are in 20 years, and hopefully we've got uh, yeah. a, a bunch more people kind of having that, that shared ethics and code of practice. We're starting to see a lot more frequently uh, in the US and Canada that you know, states and provinces and regions are trying to put dog trainer laws in place. So my personal hope is like this kind of banding together of these organizations will give us a strong unified voice to help lawmakers provide, you know, standards that are up to date, modern and fair for, you know, the human client and the animal client. So that's something that I think is going to be really positive out of this, being able to be a voice for some of the laws that will are inevitably going to come out and hopefully offer some consistency in those legislation in that legislation as well so that we don't end up with a huge variation in in regulation for dog trainers across the country but maybe something that's a little bit more consistently unified um from state to state or region to region yeah cool so it's kind of making a professional body that is going to hopefully kind of be the role model and template for rolling out that's what i hope i hope it like kind of makes this group stand out more when people who are making the laws are looking for feedback. Um, It's not something that like our main goal is not let's do this to influence lawmakers. Um, It's more like just trying to band together as an industry and set some standards or at least start to make an attempt to. Um, But but that's just my personal hope is that if we can sort of be a unified voice, perhaps it's something that will influence lawmakers Awesome. Well, excited, excited to uh, see where, where it all heads and uh, excited that it's, it's happening. It's happening right now. So thank you so much for sharing all of that, Sarah. Uh, that, that was a lot. Uh, and, and hopefully it's been super beneficial to you, the listener of this podcast show. Um, I'm looking at time and just conscious. One thing I really wanted to talk to you about today, and, and you said uh, you would like an opportunity to discuss as well, because it's what you spend your time doing, is working with urban dogs. And as you said, right at the start of the podcast New York City is the perfect air quotes playground <laughs> for for that um, type of training so so what are some main considerations that you think you might have, you might have to make in this context compared to if you weren't working in an urban context 
Well, one of the sort of things that I've really had to learn and adapt to is that you have to do a lot of work in the city that is helping dogs through over threshold moments. So it's not like if you're working in a more rural area where you can take the dog out for a walk and, you know, maybe see a a couple of dogs across the street or or down the block. Um, As soon as you go out your door, there's no front yard. There's no driveway. You're generally coming out of an apartment. So you're straight out on the street and there are people and dogs and cars and noise everywhere. I don't think we've had a siren go by the whole time we've been recording one. Um, But it is completely an inundation of stimuli. And for a dog who is fearful of one or multiple of those things, it's extremely difficult because you can't really work on a stimulus gradient That's why what my company does with the board and trains is really amazing for a lot of dogs because we can actually do some desensitization. Um, But that the main challenge is like how condensed the environment is and how frequently and at such a high intensity you will encounter stimuli that your animal is, you know, potentially fearful of. And I have unfortunately had the interesting from an observer standpoint, unfortunate from a pet owner standpoint, the ability to see how it has actually changed my dog's behavior over the past two years and a bit. Um, One of my dogs, my younger dog, who's very social, stable, but he he does get overstimulated easily. He's he's a, you know, working bred Australian shepherd. Um, He has started to develop leash reactivity. Um, and so I am applying what I know, uh, to hit, to him. And he also, uh, started behavior medication pretty recently because I took that as a sign that he was just overwhelmed by the environment and that his stress had built up to a point because it's so out of character for him. And I wanted to do that if it was something that could increase his welfare. And uh, I definitely refer or recommend that people talk to the vet or the vet behaviorist about behavior medication a lot more frequently in the city uh, because you can't change the environment and the poor dogs are over threshold when they walk out the door. It's really hard to do desensitization and it can really help dogs feel better uh, in the city. Um, You know, some of the other unique challenges is that dogs have to be on leash almost all the time. Lots of dogs don't get off-leash opportunities. They don't get to go hiking. Uh, There's not a lot of areas where dogs can go off-leash safely, especially if they're not, you know, super social. If they have any issues with people or dogs, you know, you're going to run into them anywhere you go. So it really limits the opportunities for enrichment, um, allowing a dog to express normal behaviors and exercise. So there's also some challenges on if you have a dog who's, you know, not that perfect city dog, um, on how do you work around that? How do you exercise them? How do you make sure that they're not completely frustrated being on a leash all the time? How do they get freedom? How do they get to be a dog? You know, how can we um, reduce their stress and increase their enrichment in a small space and a condensed environment that maybe they don't get a lot of off-leash time on? Uh, I also work with a lot of separation anxiety here, which is tough, uh, but people can't allow a dog to bark at all in an apartment. It's not the same as when you live in a house. If it doesn't bother your neighbors, hey, that's fine. Uh, but here, any barking is is a problem. So it's a it's a really big thing to deal with separation anxiety. So all the people listening to the podcast who have reactive dogs are thinking, why on earth would you want to live in New York City? <laughs> I ask myself that question sometimes. Um, I think it's a tough environment for a lot of dogs. Some dogs really thrive here. Um, what is what my dogs enjoy is they do get actually out more for walks than they would when we lived in a rural environment the che- because we, we have to go out for them to go to the bathroom um so they're getting like more walking but i think less off leash time especially with my dog my younger dog having some issues now um i have to really modify my exercise patterns with them because i'm probably being over cautious but i figure that's better to be than to you know let something i would regret happen um but yeah you know it everywhere you go there's people everywhere <laughs> so finding a quiet area of the park is a bit of a challenge. Um, some, like I said, some dogs do really well. There are certain personalities that they just love it. Um, it's definitely difficult if you do have a dog who's reactive. And there are some dogs who just really can't 
function here. We had to actually have one of our dogs. We had three when we moved. She went and lived with a friend back in Canada because she never adjusted. It was too scary for her. Uh, even with medication, she didn't have. We felt she didn't have a good quality of life because she was even reactive to the noises inside. Um, and she, we had her here for a while, and she just didn't really get better. So she lives with our friend in Canada now. Um, and some dogs just will never be able to tolerate it, which is it's tough, but. Some people can't tolerate it either. I mean, for me, the pros of living here is it's really cool to experience the city. I like to see the buildings. Uh, I love all the arts and culture here. But it is it's challenging as a person who lives here too. That it, it's just there's so much stimulation. So for the people that have their reactive dogs and they might not be uh, living in an urban environment, yes. they might be living in the countryside. Uh, and, you know, that that's stressful enough for them to live with, yes. a, with, a, with a reactive please, dog in that please context. Please don't move to Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> what, so what what is like, let's say, three little takeaways that you can offer that you've learned yes. from working with an urban dog that you could pass on to people that not necessarily living in those urban environments, but what specifically has this experience in your life taught you? So some of the things that have changed in my work since living in the city is uh, working a lot more with high value food rewards. When I live more rural, I could get away a lot more with using store-bought treats as like, a, that was like my high value. Um, or, you know, I would train the dogs with their kibble a lot and they were like, yeah, this is great. Here, because it's so stressful, um, you know, my clients are using things like chicken, cheese, steak. You do not get stingy on the frequency of the reinforcement and the value of the reinforcement. Um, so that's one thing is like upping the value of the reinforcement that we're using. Um, and also one other thing that has really changed for me here is focusing a little bit more on... Um, operant behaviors as far as like teaching different like incompatible behaviors so things like really heavily reinforcing attention on the handler like heavily heavily I used to always do that to some degree but we almost want the dog like offering a competition heel if you get that picture the dog is walking right beside their their handler and offering them attention very frequently so that is very heavily reinforced with high value reinforcement um, I also use a lot more head collars here um, just because the dog has to be you know very close to their handler uh, if they're reactive it's kind of a safety thing to be able to control the dog's head um, and then a lot more working on like not I don't want to say heel because we don't teach a heel we teach a loose leash walk but the dog generally we need them to be more working beside the handler than in front um, just because it's so condensed and then working a little bit more on getting like a little bit tighter on like having the dogs sit in front and stay while dogs walk by when you're in a, a less busy environment you can just go the other way you know if it's going to be something that the dog can't handle oh we can avoid this we can go the other way here you can't usually do that because there's probably another dog behind you so working a lot more on like teaching the dog to sit and stay and focus on you while the the trigger passes by so those kinds of things to help support a dog dog through something that may be a little quote unquote over threshold for them, but getting through it together and getting through it successfully and keeping our stuff together. Um, I also use, I, I would say muzzles a lot more just because it's a safety thing. Uh, if you have a dog who's people reactive, taking them out on the street with hundreds of people, it's not a bad idea to have them wear a muzzle. Helps everybody relax. Wow. Well, it's definitely... If you, if you ever move back out of the urban environment, you're going to be I'm taking just gonna a I'm just going to be home. like, wow, this is so, I'll be like, this is so easy. <laughs> sounds like sounds like a great place to learn, you know, to go and really refine oh, those skills. Oh, yeah. If you want to, like, uh, you know, get your chops in gear, man, like, it is the, I think this is the most difficult environment to train dogs in. Um, and also, you get to work with some very interesting people on the people side as well. That's one of the fun things here is I have a few celebrity clients, so that's always kind of cool. Ooh, disclaimer? Mm. Can you not no. disclaimer? What's, what's, you to, what's the word? You want it, so if you want to keep having celebrity clients, you have to be discreet about it. <laughs> well, you just said how to how to get your chops. So maybe that's the title of this episode. Sarah yes. Dixon from New York, how to get your chops to the top trainer. <laughs> It's funny because I, I used to do a lot of music and that's what you call it in music. So I don't know if that's where I got the term. With music, you could, you say chops is like skills. 
Hey, thank you so much for all of this. Sadly, we're nearly at the end, but that's okay because we're heading now into one of my favorite parts of the podcast show, and this is story time. Sarah, could you please share with everyone listening one or two stories from your experience? Uh, you've already shared some great doozies today, how you have earned your chops. Uh, but maybe, <laughs> maybe share a few more on some of the important lessons these have taught you along the way. I always think about my own dogs, and hopefully that's okay, because I think that they've been some of my best teachers. So I guess I'll tell a couple of stories about those guys. Um, so Dexter is my Belgian sheepdog, and I love this dog probably too much. Um, I got him actually because Donna, who we talked about before, had one, and I loved that dog. He was so cool. And so I ended up getting Dexter, and before that I had Huskies, and um, Dexter has taught me a lot. Uh, We've had a few lessons, good and bad. So one thing that he's taught me I, that I think has really been good for me is because he's so sensitive to my emotions, I've had to really learn good emotional control with him. When I work with him, I can't be frustrated. He knows I'm frustrated before I am. So I've really had to learn how to keep myself, keep my cool and check with him. And that is something that I think is really, really important when you're handling and working with difficult dogs. It's something that my clients comment about all the time. Oh, you know, you just have such a good, you know, calm energy for lack of a better word about you. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that comes with practice. Um, I have not always been this way. This has come with practice, working with my own dogs through trial and error. And it's something that you can learn too. So that I think is the main, one of the main things that Dexter has taught me. Um, He also, unfortunately, has taught me that competition with dogs, competing is not more important than their welfare. Um, He was a dog that I trained for years in agility. In his first agility trial, he injured himself. So his performance career, unfortunately, has been a lot of uh, pulling him from competitions because he's not been physically in good enough shape to compete and having to retire him from a lot of sports prematurely. But my dog being healthy and my dog not being in pain is more important than getting ribbons. So that's something that was important that he taught me. Um, I guess I could tell a bit of a sad story because it's in my head, but I we had, uh, we had another husky uh, in addition to Maui, who unfortunately we lost at a very young age. And what happened with him, he was a lovely dog, very wonderful. He was having some allergies and I got him neutered. And at the same time, the vet updated every single vaccine, which at the time I thought nothing of. By the way, just just disclaimer, I still vaccinate my dogs. I'm just very careful that their vaccines are not done at the same time. And he got really sick and he never got better. He actually developed an autoimmune disease um, and it made him... Uh, basically have like a severe sinus infection all the time. So we tried a whole bunch of stuff and a whole bunch of tests. And that was sort of the best diagnosis we could get is autoimmune disease. And we ended up putting him on prednisone, which helped his sinus infections, but made him really aggressive. Um, And unfortunately, we got to a place where his aggression towards us and the other animals in the household couldn't be safely managed. And he wasn't, he had no quality of life off the medication. So we decided to euthanize him and he was just over four years old. So that was an experience that I hope nobody has to go through. What I learned from it is how much changes in their body and changes in how they're feeling and how they're doing physiologically, how much that can affect behavior. Because he went from a dog with zero aggression, like really a model citizen, you could do anything to him, anyone could interact with him, he was great with all animals, to being highly aggressive to other dogs, to our cats, and to us to the point where we did not trust him to be safe around the public. We didn't trust, feel safe rehoming him. Uh, And so it was such a massive shift just because of how the medication affected his body. So that was a hard lesson, but a very valuable lesson Um, and how much physiological changes can affect behavior in ways that I don't think we fully understand a lot of the time. Um, But also, it has brought me a lot of empathy for my clients having to euthanize dogs for behavior problems. And, you know, it's allowed me to help friends and clients who have had to be in a similar place to go through that 
uh, gracefully, I guess, for lack of a better term. Yeah, it's a bit of a downer. Maybe we need a happier story. I don't know why it came into my head, I think, because we were thinking about Maui. But, uh, I mean, it is what it is. It was a long time ago now. Um, it took me a long time to be able to talk about it without getting really emotional. But it was... It was very valuable and it does, I think the thing for me is like being able to take one of the hardest things that we ever went through and, you know, take a positive out of it. Yeah, well, hopefully that's got value for people listening to this podcast. Um, luckily, I can say I haven't had to go through something like that myself, so I can only imagine hmm. um, and <laughs> have, have, have a huge knowledge gap there. And like you say, there's, yeah. there's seemingly a, a big space where... Lots in of so- learning can occur. In some ways, it makes me want to become a vet. Um, and I'll just put a quick happier lesson from our from dogs in there, so it's not ending on that downer. Um, my youngest dog, Brew, the one who I was talking a little bit about, uh, he's been a really cool dog for me to have because he's a really what we would call a quote-unquote high-drive dog. So he's very high energy. He loves to work, uh, super friendly, and he actually, because I got him, I got into herding, sheep herding with them and that has become something that I absolutely love to do so it's the hardest dog sport I've ever done um but it is really fantastic uh so he and I and Dexter train in sheep herding and Dexter's done some competitions (laughs) Brew's not ready yet um so he's definitely teaching me a lot of patience uh but he's the one who's started to struggle a little bit more in the city so he's the one who's getting a little bit reactive but again it just builds empathy for me for my clients and I can say hey you know my dog does this too and they're very relieved and you know here's what I'm doing it's exactly the same things that I'm going to tell you how to do and I know how you feel I know that it's annoying but hey guess what yeah you got to bring treats out with you on all your walks um and he's doing pretty good We'll get through it. <laughs> we'll have to move outside of the city and get a house with a yard sometime. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be a, <laughs> uh, happy if, if that happens. But yes. obviously, uh, you're doing super important things there in New York. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing all of that. It does bring us to our final episode. We started way back with uh, Maui, you know, yes. young Sarah. Could you take us past 2018 now? Let's go into the future. And, and potentially Ooh. we're going to build upon stuff that you've already shared with us in this podcast today. We've, we've shared a lot about things we'd like to see happen. But is there anything else you'd like to add as to what you would hope, like, want to see happen in the next five to ten years? So this is a really uh, loaded question for me. Um, I mean, I really like the direction that our industry is going as a whole. Um, like I said, I'm very happy with Margie being able to achieve some of these, you know, big driving forces in the dog training industry to start to work together. I think that's fantastic. Um, I know a lot of people would disagree with me, but I would like to see set standards and regulation in the dog training industry, or at least see progress with that. I think it's important. Um, I think it's really bizarre to me that we don't have set standards. I understand why we don't, because there's just so much variation in our industry and practice. But I think that there's got to be a way to set standards for education for animal trainers and ethical guidelines for animal trainers so that we are reducing the abuse that animals, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, that animals are subjected to at the hands of uneducated trainers. Um, One of the things, too, that I feel strongly is that, you know, for the most part, people who (laughs) are not maximizing positive reinforcement in their training don't do so because they don't want to. It's because they just don't, they don't have the knowledge or the skills to be able to apply that effectively. So I think that uh, more freely applicable high quality education for all animal trainers is something that we can strive for so that people have that uh, easily accessible without judgment when they want to find it. Um, I'd love to see, this is a big dream, I'd love to see less fighting within the industry and more of the trend of working together. Um, Right now we have a lot of I'm right and you're wrong and I guess it comes back to the theory of hey Let's look at interacting with each other the way that we want to interact with our animal students and reinforce and build behavior that we want to see 
and not be so negative and punishing to other dog trainers. Well, tons of, tons of value in there. And obviously, uh, we look forward to all of those things happening and podcasts like our ones, hopefully are, are creating their sparks and creating their ripples and, and doing their part. Uh, so just before we do wrap up, Sarah, remind everyone, we did it at the start of this episode, but remind everyone where they can go to find out more about you and, and get in touch. Well, I do have a website, but it's not super up to date. <laughs> Um, my website is, uh, it's actually under my non-married name. So it's sarahfulcher.com, F-U-L-C-H-E-R.com. Um, I work for a company called Instinct Dog Training. If you want to find out more about them, you can look them up. And of course, uh, we've talked a lot about the IAABC, which is the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. So I would encourage everyone to check out our website. It's IAABC.org. And if you want to kind of get a feel for like what we are and what we do, check out our journal. It's free. You can find it online. You can read some of the articles and sort of see what we offer, what we promote, get a feel for, you know, the type of what I think is exceptional quality information that we're putting out there. And that is free for anybody. And if you're interested, you can come and find me on Facebook or whatever. And I happily would talk to you about, you know, becoming a member if it's something you'd like to do or, hey, just go ahead and sign up. I wouldn't complain. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not it's not expensive to sign up, is it? It's not. Like it's, you're gonna... not. it's very reasonable, actually, for what you get from it. I think it's very reasonable. Wonderful. And of course, we will link to all of this in the show notes as well. Hey, Sarah, this has been so much fun from myself and on behalf of everyone listening. We really appreciate you taking the time, not just today to hang out, but we've linked it twice in calls already. We've been shooting emails back and forth for the last month or two. Uh, So thank you for all of the things and all Ah. of the effort. You're welcome. I hope that it has been interesting and valuable for at least one person that listens. I would say that one person would be amplified by a couple of thousand that (laughs) tune into this show on a weekly basis. Hey, we, of course, if you are one of those thousands of people, really appreciate you tuning in today as well. If you have enjoyed this episode and you are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnish, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com, click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as a Netflix social media platform for behavior nerds. There's something there for absolutely everyone. We're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode, though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening, everyone, and you'll hear from us again soon.